this very special event, uh, a tribute to Tony Horowitz. Tony Horowitz was a member of the Book Festival Advisory Board. Um, he was an inspiration to me. I'm Sue Ellen Lazarus. I run the book festival. Uh, he was an inspiration. Oh, thank you. He was an inspiration in planning the festival. He always worked with me on inviting authors, helping choose which authors to come, working with me on developing the panel discussions. So it's a real loss to not have Tony this year. When we were planning the festival, we, of course, were thrilled to have Spying on the South. When Tony died suddenly in May, we thought long and hard about what would be the best way to honor his memory. And uh, when Nathaniel stepped up and said that he would be delighted to talk about his dad's book with David Blight, and it was indeed David is here because of Tony that uh, Tony encouraged me to invite David and indeed followed up with David and said, come stay at our house and come be part of the festival. So Geraldine and Tony have both been tremendous supporters of the festival. Geraldine is also on the Book Festival Advisory Board and she does a lot of work as well. So it is our pleasure to do this in his honor. Indeed, it is, it is such, um, a heartbreaker not to have Tony here. We think that, I know when I'm walking around or at social events associated with the festival, it's the light of Tony that always was an inspiration. So with that, we get to take a minute to honor him. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie Newman who will interview both I'm sorry, introduce both David Blight and Nathaniel Brooks Horowitz. Thank you all. Um, so so this, is, uh, this is Tony and Geraldine's uh, legacy and testament. Um, we, uh, Tony's books are available for purchase uh, in the book signing tent, and, and it's a wonderful book. Um, this will be a conversation between David Blight and, um, and Nathaniel Brooks Horowitz. David Blight is a professor of American history and director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. His book, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, who many of you have heard about at this festival, another, uh, he's a comrade of Tony's, a, a his historian comrade, and, um, and it's a wonderful book as well won the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in History. It was named... <laughs> it was named one of the best books of 2018 by the New York Times Book Review, the Wall Street Journal, Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, San Francisco Chronicle, and Time Magazine. <laughs> Author or editor of a dozen books, he has also been awarded the Bancroft Prize, the American Lincoln Prize, and the Frederick Douglass Prize. Nathaniel Brooks Horowitz, Tony and Geraldine's son, is a venture capitalist in the biotechnology sector. He was the chief executive of Nivian Therapeutics, a startup company that developed an experimental drug for pancreatic cancer. His writing has been published by the Washington Post, New York Times, Boston Globe, Atlantic, Daily Beast, and Town and Country. He studied molecular biology at Harvard after graduating from the Martha's Vineyard Regional High School and reporting for the Martha's Vineyard Times. Please join me in welcoming David Blight and Nathaniel Brooks Horowitz. Thank you, Leslie and Sue Ellen, and thank you all for coming. Uh, you're here to hear a tribute to your neighbor and your friend. I want to first say thank you to Nathaniel, this brave young man next to me. Uh, we're going to both get through this, brother. <laughs> I lost my dad at the very same age, and I know I couldn't have done this. So, uh, and my dad didn't write anything, so I don't know what I would have said. And Geraldine, thank you for uh, letting Nathaniel do this. Um, I've known Tony, I don't know, way over 20 years. Uh, I'm going to share a couple stories with you. 
uh, then in a way I'm going to introduce Nathaniel in his own father's voice. And then we're going we're gonna to actually read a few passages, both of us. No better tribute to any writer, as writers know, than having somebody actually read your prose. Uh, you know, like they, as though they like it. And we do. Um, I actually first, first met Nathaniel when his dad brought him through New Haven to show him around Yale. Uh, somewhere in your teenage years. Of course, he went to Harvard anyway. Uh, not my fault. Um, on the morning after Tony died in May, I was riding a train from New Haven into New York City. I had Tony's book in the page proofs, Spying on the South, and right on my lap on the train. I had just finished it. And I was beginning to outline for my review that I was going to write for the Washington Post. And I got an email from an obituary writer at the New York Times asking me for a comment. <laughs> and I hadn't even heard. And I wrote back and asked if it was a hoax. It took me an hour on the internet emailing friends on my phone to figure out if this was true. And of course it was. Um, that day I got a very special book prize at a luncheon in New York. And when I went up to the stage, I carried his book with me. And I showed, and you know, you get 10 seconds up there with the president of Columbia University to shake hands. And I put it up in front of whatever camera there was. I don't know if anybody got it, but I, had, I took the book up with me. Why not? Um, I got so many Tony stories, I'm going to keep this short. Uh, <laughs> The last time I saw Tony was at the Organization of American Historians gathering in Philadelphia uh, in April. Um, and I had dinner with him in a sports bar. There was a whole group of us. My alma mater, Michigan State, was in the final four. So if you went to dinner with me that night, you were watching the game. And Tony sat there at a big table. We we're all watching the game. And Tony at one point said, I don't care who wins this, David. So we got to bet on this. I got to I got to have a bet on this or I won't give a damn. So let's bet dinner. If your guys win, you come to the vineyard and we take you to the best restaurant in the vineyard. And if whoever the other team is wins, Geraldine and I come to New Haven and you take us to the best restaurant. So Geraldine and Nathaniel, I owe you dinner at the Union League Club. <laughs> I do. Uh, seriously, in New Haven, we'll make a plan. Um, and it'll be in Tony's tribute. One of the early times I met Tony, you all were living in Virginia, and my, my dear late friend Jim Horton and I were doing a, a teacher institute or a, an institute for National Park Service historians and rangers at Harper's Ferry. And Tony drove up, you guys didn't live but an hour from there, he drove up for the day to cover our institute to write a piece for the New Yorker. I mean, we were a little dubious. But he spent the whole day, he interviewed the uh, National Park historians, he interviewed us. That night he said, meet me in Brunswick, Maryland, up the river for dinner. And it's another one of those little towns where Tony felt so comfortable if he could just find the right bar to go in to ask the right questions. So we met him there. My friend Jim is African-American, and he wasn't entirely comfortable in this little town uh, hanging out. But we hung out, Tony arrived, and we were looking for a restaurant. And we didn't know where to eat. I don't even know why we went to this town, except Tony told us to go there. So we go into a bar, and Tony did his usual kind of bar, bar stool journalism. He started chatting up every, all these big white guys at the bar. Where would you eat in this town? You know, and so on and so on. And my friend Jim was not entirely comfortable with this situation. We ended up having dinner, I don't know, out on some strip at some family restaurant. But we spent an unforgettable night, an unforgettable evening, talking about this institute we were doing, talking about history, talking about public history, uh, in a place that I don't even still don't know why we were in Brunswick, Maryland, except that that's where Tony, he must have had a reason he wanted to go there. But that was Tony. You'd just follow him, and you'd learn something uh, wherever you went.
Uh, there's so many other stories. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, point out one tribute that is about to come out. Uh, Tony was, about three years ago, president of the Society of American Historians. That's an old organization created about 75 years ago by people like Bruce Catton, uh, Alan Nevins, and those great narrative historians of back in the 1940s and 50s. It's an honor society. You get elected to it because you write well. It's history written well for real people. And we elected Tony, I don't know how many years ago, and then we made him president, which isn't a big deal. Being, I mean, you don't have to do much. Except Tony got very involved. He raised money for that organization. And we never have any money. All we do in that organization is have one dinner a year and give two book prizes. So the board, which I'm still on, uh, has, has just decided we're going to rename a major prize, one of the two prizes that this organization has given for years. Uh, no offense here to anybody, but it had been named for Arthur Schlesinger for years. And it now will be renamed for Tony Horowitz. It's the prize for... <laughs> it's the prize, in effect, for lifetime achievement in writing history. Um, and I want to turn it over to Nathaniel, but I'm going to let his dad do it. Uh, I don't know how carefully you've all read Tony's books. If you haven't, get busy. Um, there are a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> we've been talking about our favorites, favorite passages, and so on. This is literally the ending of Tony's book, Blue Latitudes which is the book uh, about oh, 16, 18 years ago that is the almost unbelievable tale of Captain James Cook's journeys, voyages, three great voyages all over the world and discovered really the last parts of planet Earth that um, at least Westerners had never seen. And Tony followed some of those routes on ships in the Pacific in his intrepid style when it came to ending the book, he wrote this. In Virginia, I often put my five-year-old son, Nathaniel, to bed with tales of Captain Cook. While tracing his adventures across the inflatable globe hanging above Natty's bed. I got his approval to read this one, by the way. I, I wasn't going to do this to, to Nathaniel <laughs> without him knowing it. One night after Natty fell asleep listening to the story of Captain Cook's death and dismemberment, his favorite episode, <laughs> I lay awake drowsily recalling the distance traveled, then got up and placed a toy arrow alongside Natty's globe. If I poked it through the plastic starting at our home, it would emerge in the blue latitudes off Australia, close to where Cook sailed on the Endeavor. In the early 19th century, wealthy families in Europe and America adorned their homes with wallpaper depicting scenes from Cook's voyages, including Tahitian dancers, Tongan wrestlers, and Cook's final struggle on the beach in Hawaii. Dufour, the French company that manufactured these scenic papers, advertised its product as not only decorative but didactic, useful in teaching children about geography, botany, and exotic peoples, as well as inspiring them to great things. The notion seems quaint today. Natty enjoys my stories of Cook's adventures, though he prefers to hear about wizards and hobbits. He has spent a third of his life in Australia. His room in Virginia is filled with stuffed colas and kangaroos and books about aborigines. The antipodes doesn't seem strange or unimaginable to him. If a company like Dufour were to design wallpaper today, it would probably craft images of men on the moon or weightless astronauts on space stations. This, too, was part of Cook's legacy. He was one of the world's great explorers, but also among its last. In his wake, other discoverers filled in the few remaining blanks on the map. Eventually, there wasn't any place left on Earth where no man had gone before. 
tucking Natty in, I like to think that he might become an explorer of a different sort. As Rick Kinnick, the Alaskan archaeologist, has told me, uh, had told me during our boat ride to Cook's landing site, there was evidence of a novelty-seeking gene in the human makeup. Cook, because of early deaths of his own children, wasn't able to pass this trait along. But maybe I could. If not genetically, then with my stories about the navigator. When adults ask Natty what he wants to be when he grows up, he always smiles mysteriously and says, an adventure. Making lists of supplies and companions for his future exploration fills much of his playtime. Natty's mission, like Cook's, isn't always clear. The destination is often secret or imaginary, and it tends to change from day to day. But I rejoice in the endeavor. Now, we're not going to call you Natty. <laughs> but Nathaniel, um, I have a lot of questions I want to ask you. I mostly want to hand this over to you to tell your own stories. But what on earth was it like growing up in the house of these two world-class writers? Did you find you just kind of had to ignore that? <laughs> Did you draw from it? How do you think about that? First of all, thank you all for coming. And David, thank you for that, that wonderful intro and, and everything that you've done from the review to the award ceremony uh, to the Society of American Historians. This is all greatly appreciated. Um, you know, it was fantastic. It was, it was really wonderful. It's, it's been, uh, I had a, a, a charmed childhood and it is converted into, in many ways, uh, a charmed adulthood. I think that what you are used to as a child you don't realize is unusual. So I really had no idea for, for most of my childhood uh, what exactly I had. Uh, there, were, there were a couple uh, funny ways to, to illustrate this. First of all, as, as book writers as opposed to journalists, mom and dad were almost always home. Uh, in, in Virginia, mom worked in the house and dad worked in a cabin out in the, out in the yard. In Sydney, they both worked in a room uh, just down the hall from their bedroom. Uh, you know, I would often go off to school, and they would be at home. I would come back, and they would still be at home. Uh, You're lucky. Yeah, quite. Um, you know, oft, often, often writing. Um, when we moved to Cambridge uh, in Massachusetts, uh, the day that, that Mum won the, the Pulitzer for, for her book, March, we were painting Warhammer uh, little figurines uh, from a game at home uh, when she, she got the first call from, uh, from a, a friend of hers at, at the Wall Street Journal who she thought had had too much to drink for lunch and, and was surely joking uh, until it's shortly thereafter. Too much yes. to drink, right. but not joking. <laughs> shortly thereafter, a, a photographer showed up at the front door and that's when it became clear that uh, this, was, this was not a hoax. And uh, it, it was moments like those over the course of, of the first 16 or so years that slowly pulled out the thread of, wow, you know, this is a true privilege. This has been a true blessing. And one particular memory I have of dad is, is during that time back in Waterford, uh, he would be down in this little cabin in the back of the yard. And one of the earliest memories I have from, from that time is, is walking down this stone path to the door, which was glass, and I could look in and he'd be facing his computer, hunched over, typing furiously. And it was a 50-50 shot, whether he was really in the thick of it uh, and, and didn't want to be disturbed because he was, he was working hard and, and doing something important. Uh, and a 50-50 shot that he'd be, he'd be up for coming out into the yard and, and playing some ball, whether it was 2 in the afternoon or 6 in the morning. And these are, you know, uh, perhaps my, my strongest memory is, is him as both the worker and as the, as the player. Wow, thank you. Um, you know, when did you start reading your dad? 
The uh, or did the, he make you read? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I think when I first really got got into it was when I was about thirteen, uh -huh. uh, and this was around the time where I started to have uh, you know a, a bit of a, a a middle school social life and needed to get around the island, so I began hitchhiking, and. Uh, you know, I uh, dad dad said if you're gonna hitchhike, you should really you should really read one for the road, because um, he, he had he hitchhiked, hitchhiked continents. You yes. hitchhike an island. Huh? Yes, this was a much easier task. Uh, he he hitchhiked uh, across Australia, uh, just just a couple years older than than I am now, and I, I'd like to read uh, you know one one passage uh, from from one for the road just to just to lower the tone and. Uh, after, after all of these nice things that have been said about the quality of his history, and and his writing, I just want to uh, you know make sure that we're all on the same page of just, just what kind of of, of man we we're are. We're honoring him for his about. writing. I didn't say it was this. <laughs> uh, so this was this was when he he's uh, on a on a boat in in sort of deep waters off off Australia, and uh, this is uh, really his first first encounter with with serious deep ocean. So. Waves are crashing over the side and washing into the cabin. And it's so dark that I can't even anchor my eyes on the horizon. Just the glow of the radar, tossing around in the black like a junken firefly. My equilibrium is fading fast. Gary, this is one of the deckhands on the boat, isn't helping. When he notices I've gone silent and crumpled on the cabin floor, clutching a table leg, he switches from genital geography to scatology. <laughs> Quote, if you're feeling crook, the best thing to do is stick one finger down your throat and the other one up your bum, he says. And if that doesn't work, switch fingers. <laughs> the dawn light is making things worse, not better. Now I can see what's coming. Giant walls of ocean that roll the boat over, then drop it into a trough on the other side, just in time for another wall to tilt it up again. You know, it's interesting how many words we have for vomiting, Gary continues. <laughs> Spew, chuck, toss, toss your cookies, barf, technicolor yawn, <laughs> talking to the floor. Are there that many in America? Or do you blokes just not puke as much? <laughs> I consider the matter. Whenever a guy threw up in grade school, we'd say he was calling Earl. <laughs> Why in God's name was I telling him this? You know, Earl! <laughs> <laughs> if Earl wasn't home, you'd call Ralph. Ralph! <laughs> Gary can't get over that one. As soon as Kim and Justin come up from below, yawning and stretching, he starts telling them all about Earl and Ralph. You know what the Yanks call spewing? Curling Earl. Get it? Oh! <laughs> Gary would have been a big hit on my playground. You don't have to look far in one of Tony's books to just start laughing and howling, as many of you know. He had a way of mixing, in all of his travel books, <laughs> humor with tragedy, with, and, 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 and sometimes shouldering right up to the edge of almost lampooning some of his subjects, but not quite, although some of them probably felt like they were lampooned. Um, I'm just going to this is a very brief little quote, this is in Spying on the South, and I know we're going to come back to that in a minute, but if you haven't read Spying on the South yet, go buy it, read it, it it'll just capture you. It's the book based on Frederick Law Olmsted's famous travels across the American South, and in some ways I think Tony may have found his alter ego in uh, this uh, self-described born traveler of uh, Fre Frederick Law Olmsted. Before Olmsted became the great landscape architect, he was an intrepid traveler. And among the almost unbelievable scenes, and there are some that you just, you just think he had to make this up, 
in Spying on the South, which were Tony's travels on Olmstead's route from starting in Baltimore, across West Virginia, through Kentucky, all down the Mississippi River Valley, through Louisiana, into Texas, and eventually was spending a lot of time in the hills, the German hills of East Texas, which is the heart of the book. Uh, but then finally all the way to the Mexican border. Uh, but along the way, he, he goes to what's called the Louisiana Mud Fest. If you've read the book, you have to read, you, You'd have to either see or, I don't know, you'd have to see this to believe it. I'm still not sure I believe it. It's hundreds of people gather in this 400-acre field with these giant monster trucks, and they drive them through mud until they crash the trucks or kill themselves or, I don't know. And Tony, as usual, got on these trucks with these guys, drank their 100-proof whatever with them, and but he, but he has these... Sly remarks at times. He's talking about the encampments of these people at the mud fest. And he says one of them had this sign right up in front of their tent. Because there's always in this book a political commentary going on. Because this is Tony touring America in 2016. And post, it's pre-election and post-election. And one of them has a sign in front of the tent that reads, I just thought it'd be useful this morning. I'll keep my freedom, my money, and my guns, and you can keep the change. And Tony met all kinds of these folks in what we might call Trump's America, but he also has a way of humanizing them. This same person he meets with this sign, he says, he asked him, why do you do this? <laughs> this mud fest, and the guy answers, because it isn't made in China or on an assembly line, it's all my work. People today don't have that experience today of building something, of putting their own puzzle together. So right after he's lampooned this guy, and, he, and the guy deserves it, he kind of humanizes him, which was Tony's great skill in all these hundreds and hundreds of characters he found all over the world in, in his travel writing. I, I just think that is the core of his skill. Um, and God, there's so many other passages. When you read Spying on the South, when you get to the Texas part, you'll, you'll be hurting with Tony. I mean, he ended up with a terrible concussion and really sick, as you guys know, in a hospital in Houston, I think, or no, San Antonio, and had to come home for a while, but then he went back he doesn't tell us much about what happened to him there, but he went back to finish that tour all the way to the Mexican border where that book ends with an extraordinary commenta commentary on how much that border is so fluid, so American, so Mexican, so Anglo, so Hispanic, so mixed. And I just, after today's news, went back and sort of read that ending. It, it's, it's just extraordinary, prescient. But we have a couple more passages we want to read. Yeah, and before, before we do that, I just, I just think it's important to say, uh, especially since so many of you came here uh, today because you knew Tony and, and are suffering from the loss, as, as are we, uh, that it's important to contextualize tragedy. And I just want to take a, a brief moment before we take it back to the hilarity of Dad's writing. Uh, on, on behalf of the, the folks who have been killed in, in El Paso yesterday and, and Dato in Ohio uh, this morning, uh, because uh, tragedy is, is relative, and especially uh, at a time like this, I think the best way to honor uh, folks who were, were action-oriented and adventurous and fought for what is right uh, is to do the same with our, our own lives. So we'll take 30 seconds, just a, a moment of silence, and then uh, we'll come back with with, with more humor, as Dad would have always liked to recover uh, a dark time.
Thank you very much. So uh, in, the, in the late 80s, uh, when, when mom and dad were foreign correspondents in the Middle East, the Balkans, North Africa, uh, they, they spent a couple years living in Cairo as their home base. And uh, dad, in, in one passage, recounts the, the quality of the establishment in which they had an apartment during this time, which I'd like to share with you. Soon after my visit to the pyramids, the supervisor of the building in which Geraldine and I resided wrote a brief summary of the structure's condition. The building, one of the newest and reputedly one of the nicest apartment houses on the Nile island of Jazeera, was described by the supervisor as follows. One, the marble is falling off from pillars inside and outside the building. Two, the main stairs are collapsing. <laughs> Three, the walls and ceilings are in poor condition, filled with dust and spiders. Four, there are constant breakdowns of the electricity, the lighting in the apartments, and the elevators. Five, the three water pumps do not work because maintenance was stopped a year ago. The room which contains the three pumps has no floor tiles and has become a lake full of water. And now you've got to remember that this is the supervisor of the building who is saying this, so God knows if that's how he's willing to describe the newest and reputedly best building on the Nile, uh, the reality can only have been worse. As Dad wrote, none of this was news to us except that the fact that the building had a supervisor at all. <laughs> Still, something that, had bothered to ca that someone had bothered to catalog the building's woes was in itself remarkable. Nothing happened. What was worse, I found myself not caring. The water main burst? Malesh. I'll shower with bottled water. There are 11 tenants trapped in the elevator again? Malesh. I'll take the 20 stairs. The males being tossed in a forgotten storeroom filled with dust and spiders? Malesh. I doubt there was anything important anyway. <laughs> and I'd only been in Cairo a few months. In another year, I feared, the Egyptian inertia would so overwhelm me that I'd be clambering over mummified residents as I scrambled through the unlit stairwell. <laughs> and that was from a, a chapter called Ozymandias Slept Here. Uh, <laughs> You know, Dad, Dad uh, had, a, had a, uh, an attraction towards potentially uh, places that the rest of us would find somewhat undesirable. In another chapter called Khartoum, This is the Way the World Ends, he wrote, The man behind the desk at the Sahara Hotel stared at me in disbelief. You want to what? He asked. Walk. You know, stretch my legs. Where? Outside. But why? <laughs> to see Khartoum. There is nothing to see. And it is dark. <laughs> there was nothing to see inside either. The power had blacked out soon after my arrival, and the hotel's only other guest, a Welsh water engineer, sat in the lobby reading a month-old London Times by candlelight. When I persisted, the man behind the desk gave in with an exasperated shrug. If the power returns, I will give you our kerosene lamp, so you will not fall in the holes, he said. <laughs> the Welsh engineer laughed. Give him a bloody blowtorch. That way you can keep the beggars away, too. <laughs> An hour later, the power was still down, so I ventured into the dark with the Welshman's cigarette lighter instead. Oh, bravo. Nathaniel, it, no better way to stomp out grief than with your dad's humor. Uh, we're both going to end here and then turn it over to you. I'm just going to read a very brief passage of my own, and then Nathaniel has a concluding passage, too. And then we're going we're gonna to keep on time. Uh, and then we welcome questions, comments, tributes. This is just the last tiny paragraph of my uh, tribute to Tony, I, I think was in the Washington Post. <clears throat> A unique voice had gone silent. 
the man who could make anyone talk to him, even when in bitter disagreement, would not talk anymore. But Tony Horowitz is hardly silent. His astonishing production of history and journalism and travel literature about the world and national issues of our time stands for all time as the creation of one of our great writers. We might fittingly remember him as we are now remembering Walt Whitman at the poet's 200th anniversary. Afoot and lighthearted, I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. Camarado, I give you my hand. So uh, after the Q&A, we will wrap up with one final passage from Spying on the South, Dad's uh, last and, and in some ways best book. Uh, but before that, just, just a couple notes. Um, one is that uh, David, as, as you've heard, has written a fantastic book of his own, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, and he will be speaking about that book in this tent uh, immediately after our talk here. So go stretch your legs and then come back to hear David on his own masterpiece. He's already learned to do promotion. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I worked in that. Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, before we read this, this final passage and break, we would love to hear uh, any, any brief tributes or, or questions uh, that you have. And uh, just based on, on some of the questions from uh, other presentations we sat in, if these could be brief in the best of ways. Uh, we would love to hear from as many people as possible in our remaining time. So please come up to the microphones on either side and we'll al alternate between them. Thank you for this. Right in the mic. Oh. You'd think I'd know something about microphones, but. <laughs> You've had a mic at your mouth before. One of the things that I came away from both Hmm? Is this better? Yes. yes. Kiss what, the mic. One of the things about both Spine on the South and Confederates in the Attic is that for all of the way, as you've both talked about, he could humanize very different people. I came away from both books, and I've just, just read them, profoundly depressed about the possibility of changing who they were and how they saw how did Tony feel about that? First of all, Dad was, was never cynical. Uh, he was often uh, d depressed or, or upset by the ways in which uh, the legacy of the Civil War had been uh, transformed into a tool uh, of white supremacy. He was often uh, disappointed in, in our country when we did things like elect uh, Donald Trump. But he also recognized that the forces driving these mistakes don't happen in a vacuum. They don't happen uh, just because people are born bad. They happen because of the unique experiences and circumstances into which we all grow up. And as a result of that, when he went to uh, places that many of us have never been and do not understand, places in the deep south or across the world, he recognized that everyone was coming from a unique experience from which you couldn't necessarily remove oneself to think about the world from another perspective. And I think that gave him an almost a unique ability in which to understand where people were coming from, to tell their stories, not in such a way that he necessarily empowered uh, negative views, but in such a way that he made it clear that the person delivering these views was still a human themselves, and that therefore the only way in which uh, we can work with that, is to work from that same place of empathy, to meet people where they are, rather than where we wish they were. Oh. I would only add that I think Confederates in the Attic, which I've taught many times to undergraduates, is in the end a tragic book. And tragic in the sense that it is, it, it, it takes us, it, excuse me, it takes us 
to places where tragedy works on us, makes us learn something. It may depress us as it, as it did you as a reader. Um, I've always felt though that Tony's one of those people who understood tragedy in a very genuine way, but always felt his obligation to lift back out of it. And in the very humanity of the people we do not understand is where he found it, just as you said. Yes, sir. I have a very quirky question. A couple of years ago, uh, your father and mother were at an event for where the the, uh, the crew of Treme, the actors in Treme, were here for raising money, I think, for Obama. And as so often happened, you know, your father was a man that anybody could walk up to and talk to. And I mentioned that I'd often been at events where they were there, but I'd never had any of their books with me. And your father said, well, come to the house sometime and bring them and we'll sign them. And I never did. What would I have found if I had come to the house? That's a wonderful question. Uh, so, so right now we, we live on uh, a, a pretty rural subset of what used to be a, a farm, a mill, uh, a mill farm. Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful little piece of land with a couple streams running through it. Uh, we have uh, a couple horses, a couple dogs. We used to have three alpacas. Uh, which are, were all quite wonderful. Mom and, mom and dad had an affinity for, uh, for the, the old uh, and, and sometimes the arcane. They were both, you know, dad through, through his history and mom through her historical fiction, attracted in some ways to the past. And as a result of that, we lived often in a, in a string of old houses. The, the current one dating back, I think, to the early 1700s, uh, 1740. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's a, a beautiful old uh, shingled farmhouse uh, and, and uh, a wonderful garden that, that mom uh, toil, toils over throughout the, the spring and the summer. And it's, uh, it's filled with books, although less so than it used to be because we've been doing our best to declutter and, and, and give uh, many of them away. Uh, it used to be the case that uh, you literally couldn't necessarily maneuver through certain rooms because so many books were stacked on so many pieces of furniture. And uh, I think the most uh, important thing you would have found is happiness uh, because he was a very happy man most of the time and, and shared that happiness with, with many others. And, and that really imbues the place even now in his absence. I'm, I'm Marissa, and I live here year-round, and um, in 2017, Tony didn't know me very well, and I flew to New Orleans. This is just a quick tribute, and I decided to just learn everything on my own and went to all these obscure lectures, and I would call him on the phone, and he took the time to like help me understand what I was learning so I could go back to every single Park Service lecture where they had a racist moment, and I could trouble the waters, and then when I got back here, I was working on Viking stuff, and he, brought, he invited me over to the house, and he was reading my writing if I wrote about something in New Orleans and made me feel like I was important and valuable and interesting and intelligent, which I am, but he gave me, <laughs> <laughs> he gave me a great sense of, like, for someone who has a pulpit like his to give me a sense of my voice mattering, he gave his, he made his knowledge contagious and he was so generous with like the process of unveiling history and I just feel like grateful for this man and grateful that you guys are continuing it and I just wanted to honor for a minute how much he gave me so good morning I'm a player with softball Chilmock softball which Tony was uh, an integral part of our game some of you may not know but um, we were privileged to have his constant commentary after every hit or catch and he would put his little twist on it and the things that would come out of his mouth, I don't know how we would think of it. And then at the end of the game he would write a little excerpt up and put a little twist on it with his, his way. And I want you to know that he sorely missed. The, the game still goes on. We think of him but there's a vacuum without him. And oddly enough, one of the player's daughters interviewed Tony in a video and said, Tony, when you die, what do you want done? Or something like that. And we have the video where he said, when I die, I want my ashes buried in this field with my mitt. 
and I believe his family has fulfilled his wishes. So he's with us all the time. He's an amazing man. Are the collected softball commentaries going to be published? You know, uh, given, given Ralph and, and Earl, uh, I, I would say that the softball commentary often made that seem like, uh, oh like, a, like oh a teacher's lecture. So I think perhaps best for all if, if, the, if the softball oh, commentary... I think this could have an underground <laughs> life. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Uh, but no, he, he absolutely loved that. That, that softball game, is, uh, he would bound out of bed at 6 in the morning on, on, on Sundays to, to go up and play that game, which uh, I would only ever be aware of if I was, if was sneaking back in, coming home from a party. <laughs> um, and, and otherwise, was very hard to, to rouse from a slumber. But this, this game, he absolutely adored, and he adored everyone who played it. And uh, with regards to, to his ashes, uh, you know, I, I later found out uh, that uh, it is a, a flagrant violation of both state and local law to <laughs> bury human remains on public property without a funeral director present. Uh, we did it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, because that's what he wanted. So, so his, his ashes and his favorite baseball mitt are, are buried unmarked somewhere in Flanders Field where, where no funeral director will be able to recover them, even if they tried. Uh, and we hope that the, the happiness that filled his life fills that softball game and that field for, for many years to come. So we, we have five more minutes, but if, the, if there's no one else who, who'd like to speak, I think we might uh, pull off the unprecedented act of, of finishing one of these events early. So. Oh, we have we have one more. Could you comment on Tony's uh, parents? What kind of background did he grow up in himself? So the the question was, uh, can you comment on on Tony's parents and what sort of background uh, did he grow up in himself? And uh, he he also had a, a a somewhat charmed childhood. He he grew up in in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Uh, on on the si edge of D.C., uh, not not far from uh, not far from where he died. His mother was a writer and, and an artist. She did children's books and a gargoyle on the National Cathedral. Uh, was uh, uh, really a, a creative spirit in his life. And uh, his father was a neurosurgeon, starting very early uh, with uh, an accelerated military neurosurgery program. Uh, so he went on to practice for, for many, many decades, late into his, his 70s, was still consulting on cases uh, in his, his early 80s. Uh, you know, he was, he was often absent uh, when, when dad was young, but they really developed a, an incredible relationship uh, in later years. And, and uh, Eleanor, his, his mom, was, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine uh, many better uh, uh, folks to have as a, a children book illustrator and, and writer for, for a mom. Um, there was, uh, you know, they, they were both incredibly inspiring people and in part my uh, ventures into, into biomedicine were inspired by, by Tony's dad, Norman, uh, who, who gave me medical textbooks when I was about nine. Uh, is probably appalled that I decided to go straight into the biotech industry without going to medical school first, um, as was... But he uh, got you out of fiction, anyway. He, d he did get me out of fiction. <laughs> uh, much to Dad's horror, I became a molecular biologist. Uh, but it was, it was really uh, a, great, a great pair of parents, uh, a wonderful home, an excellent brother and an excellent sister. And uh, he, I think he really took the lessons of, of that charm childhood in order to raise me and my, my brother Bizu in a, a similarly favorable way. So. I'd only add one quick thing, and this is only as a reader. Uh, those of you who have read Tony carefully know that his, his Jewish background is a theme that weaves in and out uh, of his writing at times. Sometimes, <laughs> in a kind of irreverent way, uh, to say the least, when he's in West Texas trying to live up to Olmsted's image, riding a donkey through the hills, he keeps calling himself the rhinestone Jew boy. <laughs> and, uh, you know... 
I don't know why, but it's, it's a very interesting theme throughout his writing. Confederates in the Attic has a lot of that, too. So it's, it's, a, it's a thing to look for. Uh, but you would know more about that than I would. Well, I, thank you all again uh, for coming, and I, I do encourage you to stick around for David. We're just going to end with one last reading uh, from, from Spying on the South. And at the end of Spying on the South, Dad had been somewhat disheartened by the divide he had seen. Um, not quite as bad as in the Olmsted era before the Civil War, but, but not that far from it either. Uh, he had ventured into Central Park, which Frederick Law Olmsted designed after the period of his life covered by, by Dad's writing. And uh, he, was, he was looking for, for some, sense of, some sense of solace. He wrote, This came home to me during my final hour in Central Park, when I rested on a bluff above the Harlem Mere. Below, a lone man fished in the drizzling rain, across from a men's prison just north of the park on West 110th Street. I was wearily debating whether to hike down to the mirror for a final interview when a black kid scooted past me on a hoverboard, trailed by a youngster on a bicycle. I watched as they rode over to a tree where they stood for a full 10 minutes, mesmerized by the squirrels scampering up and down the trunk. Then I went over to speak with them. They seemed wary of me at first, having doubtless been cautioned about talking to adult strangers. Then the older boy told me his name was Justin, he just started sixth grade, and he came to the park every weekend with his little brother from the apartment block where they lived in Harlem. What do you like best about the park? I asked. Justin replied, just exploring, going where I want. Sometimes I get lost. I told him that the man who created the park would be pleased to hear that. What's his name? Justin asked. Dad replied, Frederick Law Olmsted, Fred to his family and friends. I can tell you all about him. <laughs> At which point Justin promptly got back on his hoverboard <laughs> and motioned to his brother. Then he turned back to me and said, tell Fred he did good. <laughs> Before leading his brother down a winding path and into the woods. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>